Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast. Brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights and expression. All right, folks, welcome back to the show. I am, of course, your host, Nico Perino, and today I am joined by Yasha Monk. He is a writer and academic. He's known for his work on the rise of populism and the crisis of liberal democracy. He is also a professor of practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins University and the founder of the digital magazine Persuasion, which we at FIRE love. Uh, We work with your team over there uh, to write quite a bit. You're a contributing editor as well at... And we're very grateful, sorry to cut in, for the excellent articles that you often publish in our pages. So if uh, listeners want to uh, see the most interesting stuff at FIRE, it's up to one good source to subscribe to Persuasion. What's the URL there, Yasha? It's persuasion.community. Okay. And I want to return to Persuasion as soon as I'm done introducing you, because I think the kind of origin story of Persuasion ties in perhaps with... I'm guessing the origin story of this book, but um, in addition to being the founder of Persuasion, you're also a contributing editor at The Atlantic, a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and you've authored five books, your latest, out on September 26th, is titled Identity Trap, A Story of Ideas and Power in Our Time. Yasha, welcome onto the show. Thank you so much. So the origin story of this book, I imagine the kind of kernels of thinking around it began in the summer of 2020. Um, But correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I would say that they start earlier, actually, right? So so, so as you were saying in the introduction, um, uh, you know, I've been working a lot on the threat to our democratic institutions from populists, uh, some of whom are on the left, like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, but many and most of whom are on the right, from Donald Trump to uh, people like Recep Erdogan in Turkey or Narendra Modi in India. Um, but all along, I have also worried about a loss of support for liberal values more broadly. So when you go back to something like The People Versus Democracy, my, my first big book on, uh, on, 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 on the topic of, of, of populism and democracy, I have a number of pages that Fire would love, I think, about... Um, the ways in which big parts of the left have given up on the idea of free speech and started to somehow code it as a conservative value and why that is a mistake, why that's a betrayal both of democratic values and actually of the historical values of the left. So in a way, I've been concerned about this set of ideas for a long time. The reason why I now decided to write a book about them uh, has a few causes. The first is that I still remain very worried about, for example, Donald Trump winning the 2024 elections. But Uh, We've had a lot of books on Trump. We've had a lot of books on populism. We've had a lot of books on the crisis of democracy. I didn't think that I could add by writing another one. And if we are warning about these figures all the time, and yet we still retain a lot of electoral support, perhaps at some point we have to look ourselves a little bit in the mirror and ask ourselves why that is. And the other reason is that I've just been fascinated by the rise of a set of ideas um, in the best versions, very sophisticated and interesting ideas, about race and gender and sexual orientation that has just transformed a lot of academia where I teach, that has started in a very rapid way to uh, uh, change the way that important institutions and social spaces and corporations and religious communities run themselves in the United States. Um, And so first of all, I wanted to approach this as an intellectual historian, as a political theorist, understanding where these ideas actually come from. Uh, But then as part of that, I I, I did want to critique them because uh, I do think uh, that they have been corrosive for institutions like the ACLU, for the way we educate our children, even for some important areas of public policy, uh, like um, the kind of uh, decisions that the CDC made during the pandemic for how to uh, prioritize uh, uh, scarce covid Vaccines. So the summer of, of, of 2020 and some of the uh, you know, ways in which people got fired for very spurious grounds, uh, which I covered, including an you know, electrician in San Diego who's Latino himself, who was hanging, you know, his hand was dangling out of his truck and somebody thought he was making some white supremacist symbol, which is the OK symbol. Um, uh, and then he got fired from the best job he ever had. That, that's, that's part of what motivated me. And I talk a little bit about those kinds of 
stories in the book, but it's not a, it's not a book about cancel culture. It's not a book about those outrages that we've heard a lot about. It really tries to go beyond that and deeper than that. Yeah. So if uh, if we were kind of encapsulating the book in a nutshell, it it is part intellectual history of the rise of kind of identitarian thinking uh, on the left, how that thinking has shaped or corroded certain institutions and and our public discourse. And then y- you end with some, you know, explanation as to why this identity thinking uh, is a trap and kind of what the solution slash way forward is for it. And I think when a lot of the public thinks about this issue, they think of wokeness, that's the word they use. Uh, they think of identity politics, perhaps, uh, identitarianism, uh, the word I just used. But you have a unique phrase for it in the book. Can you explain what that phrase is and why you de- you decided to kind of, are trying to change the lexicon surrounding it? Yeah. So look, with all kinds of political ideologies, you can have deep disagreements about whether they're a good or a bad idea. But even people who disagree about the merits of these ideas can agree on what to call them, right? Socialism is a great example. Some listeners might love socialism. Some listeners might hate socialism. But but both of those sets of listeners are going to be able to say, yes, I, the word socialist is the appropriate word to use in describing a particular ideology, right? Now, I, I, part of my argument here is that we have a genuinely new ideology that, that has arisen in the United States. You know, when people invoke the term woke, Sometimes uh, people like your dear friend Ron DeSantis, who you have sued many, many times and still fire gets dragged online for supposedly never standing up to uh, the right on free speech. It's um, funny you say that, Yasha, because like every day, our, I, you know, I fire's Twitter feed and our responses and mentions in, in a tweet deck. Sometimes you have a, a tweet criticizing fire for being right wing atop a separate tweet criticizing us for being left-wing it's just kind of i guess the nature of doing and it's i mean i i get the same problem right i keep you know people keep saying oh you know yasha never criticizes the right on these things i've written a number of articles in the atlantic uh uh, touting fires work and criticizing uh ron DeSantis's um uh you know laws restricting what can be taught at public universities for example just as an aside uh you know i teach college students about about the subject of our conversation today and I don't, I don't think my job is to indoctrinate students. I think my job is to give them the tools to make up their own mind. And so I assign things that are critical of the ideas we're talking about today. But I also assign some of the people who uh, helped bring those ideas into the world, like Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw. I would not be able to teach that course at a public college or university in Florida because it would be considered a form of identity politics or critical race theory, which uh, are prohibited by some of those laws that DeSantis, uh, uh, you know, is trying to pass and you're trying to uh, get get ruled unconstitutional. So, um, uh, so anyway, this is, this is really an aside. Um, but, but, but the point is that when people like DeSantis talk about wokeness, right, they, they talk about just anything they, they don't like, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, considering these ideas in 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 in, in public colleges is, is is supposedly woke. I mean, as a result, people on the left often say, "Well, woke is just you know, it's just wanting to be nice to people who've been marginalized." Or critical race theory is just wanting to think critically about the role that race plays in society. Right. The, the core of my argument in this book is that this is really a new ideology. That it is a distinct strand of left wing thinking. Uh, that is in very important ways different from what the left looked like 50 or 25 years ago. And that therefore we need to have a term for it and we need to understand it. And so the identity synthesis simply means this is a set of ideas about the role that identity categories like race and gender and sexual orientation uh, uh, do play in society and should play in society. And they are a synthesis of various intellectual influences including, I would argue, uh, uh, postmodernism and postcolonialism and critical race theory. That's the term I use in the book so that I can talk about these ideas in a way that hopefully invites serious consideration and discussion rather than making it sound like I'm an, an old man shouting at the clouds. Um, if you prefer to call it something else, I don't care. We just need some neutral term yeah. which we can use as a basis for the conversation. Well, I don't necessarily care to call it something else. And I do want to get turn next to the intellectual 
history behind kind of these ideas, but I do want to rest first on on kind of the use of language in society to <laughs> paraphrase or directly quote uh, the title of that uh, George Orwell essay. Um, because one of the things that we found at FIRE throughout our history is that we'll have a phrase for something. And people generally understand what that means, even if they can't agree about the specific definition. It's still useful to kind of point directionally toward a trend. You saw this with political correctness in the 90s and 2000s, and then it kind of became old hat, you know, it became kind of the old man. But like, it, it did mean something, right? Like we, we, I think, generally understood kind of what it means. In the same way, I think we generally kind of understand what wokeness means, even if it's kind of a more, an amorphous concept. It, it speaks to a certain type of ideology or person or sense of seeing the world. Uh, Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott, Greg, my boss, um, they're about to come out with a book called Canceling the American Mind in a couple of weeks. Uh, and they wrestled with the idea of, you know, it's about cancel culture and and issues associated with it. They wrestled with the idea of whether to call it cancel culture or lean into cancel culture. But then they, they thought it's like, and we've done some surveys at FIRE, people know what that phrase means generally, even if they might have different definitions of what a, a cancellation is. I don't, I'm not sure there's a Oxford dictionary definition of what a cancellation is. So, you know, we, they worried that like changing the word might just confuse people. But you you and your book are trying to speak to a, a new phenomenon that, se- that seems like separate a little bit from wokeness, um, separate from political correctness, but it's something to focus is on identity. And it's not just politics, it's also a philosophy and a way of, uh, of, of viewing that world. So let's, let's take a step back here and talk about the origins of the identity th- synthesis. Uh, I just got done reading Chris Rufo's book, uh, which, uh, what is it? Uh, America's Cultural Revolution. And by the time this comes out, I might have a review of it up at the Daily Beast. Uh, but I think he's trying to speak to similar trends that you are. It focuses on Herbert Marcuse, uh, Paula Ferreira, Derek Bell, um, and Angela Davis, some of whom you talk about in your book, but you also spend a lot of time on, on Foucault. So can you talk about the intellectual history behind the identity synthesis and how you see it all play together and transform into what we have today? Yeah, so first of all, you know, uh, it's really remarkable that there have been barely any uh, academics uh, who have tried to tell the story of the origin of these ideas. I think it's part of uh, the way in which uh, uh, serious consideration of these ideas and some criticism of these ideas has become taboo in the academy. It's very strange to me that there's a whole, you know, universe of intellectual historians who somehow have not thought that this obviously quite major change in how the left thinks about the world is worthy of that kind of study. And so the kinds of people who have stepped into that space are political activists like Chris Rufo. Now, Rufo is somebody who I've debated in a number of uh, uh, fora. I obviously disagree with him deeply. He's a smart guy. He's not a trained intellectual historian, and, 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 and he ends up making this case, which has become the sort of shorthand on all of the sort of conservative side of the spectrum, that these ideas are just a form of cultural Marxism, right? And the idea of, of, of cultural Marxism basically is that you take the classic Marxist set of ideas. You take out categories like social class, you put in identity categories uh, like race and gender and sexual orientation, and boom, you basically have what there was, right? Um, Now, I have a number of reasons why I really think that that's wrong. The first is that saying that you're going to take social class out of Marxism is a little bit like saying you're going to take bats out of baseball. There's just not very much of it left, right? And as a result that lineage doesn't help you explain how you end up today. No, I understand that Angela Davis was radical and today there's some activists who are radical and they like to invoke Angela Davis, but I just don't think that actually studying the work and the text of Angela Davis helps you understand the contours of today's movements for social justice, the I, contours I think- of the kind of politics we have today. Yeah, I, and I read your appendix in your book where you kind of <laughs> do a deep dive into whether the ideas that you discuss are a form of cultural Marxism or whether cultural Marxism is even a phrase that that should be used. I think that Rufo and others who do use those phrases, uh, you know, I think Jordan Peterson is another, 
say, okay, yeah, class is removed from it, but the kind of oppressor oppressed narrative um, that that Marx used in the in the in in the sense of uh, like uh, the proletariat or or you know the owners of the means of production use is just being replaced by you know victims and their oppressors and that a lot of the people who have done that replacement from the original Marx angles have come from a Marxist background, right? Like you look at Herbert Marcuse, who who was from the Frankfurt Institute for Social Research, which is an original, you know, originally kind of a Marxist think tank. You look at Paul Ferreira, you look at Angela Davis, they have Marxist backgrounds, but they transformed the Marxist ideas into something different. So I can see how you would see, you would call it Marxist because the origins of its thinking in some ways derive from Marxist thinkers, but it is something different, right? Um, yeah, so, so, so let, I mean, it's kind of interesting to have this conversation in a little bit of detail, right? Um, so, uh, first of all, I think the idea that there's people who are in some ways oppressive and people who are in some ways oppressed is a very old idea that predates Marxism. And that, in many contexts, is reasonable, right? I mean, did, uh, uh, you know, feudal lords oppress serfs? Of course they did, right? Did slave, did slave owners oppress uh, the people who were enslaved in the United States, of course they did too, right? So, so the idea that sort of like, oh, you know, Marxists talk in some context about oppression and these people today talk about oppression and so therefore that's at the heart of the ideology, I think is a little bit too, too simple. And it leaves out some really important structural dissimilarities between Marxism and this ideology. So one that I think is very interesting, and I'm not a Marxist, is that Marxism had a kind of utopian promise at the end. Right. If you actually look at how Marx thinks about history and how historical materialists in his wake think about how they can predict the future, they say proletarians are going to gain class consciousness. We're going to stage a social revolution and there'll be some period of struggle and, 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 and so on. But eventually the state will wither away and the proletariat will have become a universal class. And what they mean by that is that in the society we ultimately hope and aim for, the, the category of distinction, social class, has disappeared. So it's not like, you know, to, uh, to deal with our oppressors, we have to build a society where we're continually thinking about the nature of that oppression and the, uh, you know, f formerly oppressed are now being put in positions to sort of invert the hierarchy, right? No, they're saying in that great future, there might be some violence in between and, and so on, right? There's a bit of a black box about how we get there, which is one reason why I'm not a Marxist. But in that society, we're all going to be brothers. We're all going to be the same. We're all going to stand in solidarity with each other. That helps me understand why my grandparents were Marxists, unlike the inventors of the identity synthesis. We'll get to that. Right? <laughs> uh, the, the ideology we are talking about today doesn't have that promise. right? Who annoys these people more than anybody else? My good friend Thomas Chatterton Williams. Right, who's saying perhaps we should be more critical about the category of race in American society. Perhaps the ultimate goal we should have, people like Karen and Barbara Fields make the same point, is you know, if race is at the root of these forms of historical injustice, then the ultimate overcoming of these injustices would be to abolish the category of race, to realize that this is a form of racecraft that um, imposes this thinking on us, and the true liberation would be to move beyond that. I'm not sure that's quite my position, but but, but that is the thing that maximally provokes people like Ibram X. Kendi and Robin D'Angelo, because they don't want a society where we abolish these categories. They think that these categories have always and will forever structure society in a fundamental way. I think that's a very important point of difference. But the most important point of difference is simply as a matter of intellectual history. right? So, so, so I'm going to tell briefly a story of where these ideas actually come from, emphasizing the ways in which these thinkers are not Marxist, and showing you at the end a payoff, which is once you've gone through them, you get what politics looks like today, which you just don't by looking at Angela Davis and uh, whoever else, right? So, so where do these ideas come from? I think the starting point is Michel Foucault. Now, Foucault does start uh, to study with a, a famous Marxist at one point. He is a member of a French Communist Party, uh, from 1950 to 1953, when he's a very young man. But his whole intellectual project is driven by the fact that he rejects the Communist Party, finds it hugely stifling, homophobic, anti-Semitic. And he says, you know, in the 50s, 
people like Jean-Paul Sartre and the Communist Party laid down the law. You were either with them and with Marxism or against them. From the day I left the party, I was against them. Right? Um, and Foucault uh, 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 has as his intellectual lodestar the idea that grand narratives which structure our understanding of the world in a, in a broad way uh, are very dangerous, that they cloak our ability to actually understand our society and that they justify terrible oppression. Now, he included under that liberal democracy, one of the reasons why I disagree with Michel Foucault, he thought that his institutions and the narrative of the French Revolution and the Enlightenment and the great way in which we've been able to make progress, all of that is a grand narrative that he found to be suspect. But just as strongly, he rejected Marxism, which he thought of as another rival grand narrative, which was wrong for exactly the same reasons. And so Foucault ends up with a very influential account of political power, in which he says we shouldn't think of power the way that a legal organization does, right, as laws and uh, state bureaucracy and cops and judges that sort of enforce it from the top down, but rather as discourses that really um, determine uh, how uh, we influence each other, uh, what norms and ideas and identity labels constrain how we can act with each other. That is the real locus of social power. That is really what we should be worried about. And so you have, after that, a series of post-colonial thinkers um, who are very attracted to the negative potential of Foucault's critique, to their ability to uh, criticize colonial discourses, criticize forms of oppression that the countries have, in fact, suffered, right? But they worry about the fact that, Fou that the implications of Foucault's thought seem to be quite fatalistic, that he thinks any discourse is going to be oppressive. And so fighting against one discourse is not really going to help you make a better world because the next one is going to be as oppressive as the, as the one before. So they try to use that negative critique but make it more political. And the first key step here is Edward Said in Orientalism, who says, yes, Foucault is right. He's the most helpful person in helping me understand um, how the discourse of Orientalism, of the idea of what the East is, has allowed the West to oppress these countries, to, to justify its forms of coercion. But the point is not just to describe that, it is in fact to invert those hierarchies, to create a new discourse which is going to allow those formerly colonized people to rule themselves and to take on the social power of the West. And that becomes phenomenally influential, first in gender studies and media studies and so on, and then in our popular culture. What it is to do politics today a lot of the time is not to fight for a particular piece of legislation, but to critique or celebrate or show how uh, uh, it is problematic, something like the Barbie movie, right? Um, the, the second step is a post-colonial thinker called um, Gayatri Spivak, um, who, uh, again, is deeply influenced. She's not a Marxist. She's um, a, a, a postmodernist, a post-structuralist. She comes, uh, uh, you know, to note firstly by uh, translating and writing very long introduction to Jacques Derrida's On Grammatology, right? Um, and she's grappling with the fact that for these postmodernists who reject all kinds of uh, ideas of scientific truth and, and objective reality, they're also really critical of identity labels, which they think are really constraining, right? Foucault, who in our terms was gay or homosexual, said... The idea of a homosexual is this really constraining label, which is far too simplistic about the variety of sexual experience, and I don't want to think of myself as a homosexual, right? Um, and Spivak says, look, uh, I agree philosophically with the critiques of these essentializing discourses, saying that if I say you're gay, that's something really meaningful about who you are deep down, right? But for practical purposes, I want to be able to speak on behalf of the most oppressed, Right? Whereas Foucault says white workers can speak for themselves, we don't need to speak for them, and we can't anyway because there's no current identity categories. Spivak says, well, I'm from Kolkata, and people were really poor, and they, a lot of them didn't have a chance to have an education. Somebody has to speak for those, quote, quote, subalterns. And so how are you going to do that? We need to find a way to repoliticize this. And, and she embraces this idea of what's called strategic essentialism. So she says, even for philosophically speaking, these notions of identity are, 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 are suspect. For practical strategic purposes, we need to keep going uh, 
uh, with them. We need to embrace them. We need to encourage people to define themselves by their identity. And again, here you really understand a key aspect of our modern reality. Why, when you go to an activist meeting, will people say, race is a social construct, something I broadly agree with, and then go on to say, well, black and brown people do this, and you know, queer people demand that. Well, it is an applied form of strategic essentialism. That's what helps to explain why many progressive educators in schools and universities uh, impose these racially segregated affinity groups and tell people to to think of themselves as racial beings. It is derived from Spivak. Go ahead. Yeah, can can I pick up on that a little bit? Because I, I agree with you in the racial context that, that you describe, but they haven't really adopted the strategic essentialism in kind of the context of the trans issues, right? Because you'll see the argument that gender is just a social construct. And it's one thing to argue that, or, or to argue, you know, why transition is necessary and important um, or social con- or why gender is a social construct. It's another thing to actually get the surgeries to make it a reality. And then in that case, it's not political discourse. It's like you actually think in order to be um, trans, you need to change your kind of physical makeup. Does that make sense? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I think... Uh, I think that, 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 that so that so in that case, it's just not like a political ret- rhetorical well, strategy. But no, I, I think that's more complicated, right? So 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 I agree that there is a sort of interesting tension which some serious scholars like Rogers Brubaker and Rebecca Tuvel have have explored in the way that progressives think about race on the one side and the way that they think about questions like trans on the other side. Um, but if you think but, of the idea but, as, but, as but a whole, if, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. But 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 but, but if you were right, then uh, and, and people really were. Uh, 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 sort of anti-essentialist in this way, then they wouldn't, you know, there's still this very strong sense that, uh, pe- you know, trans activists want self-ID laws, for example, right? So mm-hmm. it's true that, that, that some trans people desire a physical transformation of their bodies. But it's also true at the same time that they say, no, if you feel that you're a member of that other gender, then that is determinative when you are pre-op or when you choose not to have an operation at all. Yes. Right? Okay. And so, yeah. so I think it's a little bit more complicated. But I'm not saying that these ideas are always applied completely consistently. In context. <laughs> the, the question is, does my intellectual history actually may help to make sense of where we're at today? Yeah. Right? And I think that 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 Spivak's concept of strategic essentialism is really a key to understanding a lot of social reality today, even if it's not always applied a hundred percent consistently in a way that that the thought of say someone like Angela Davis is not. So, how does critical race theory? fit into all this? So, so that's really the, the next step. Um, and again, you know, you look at critical race theory, it has the word critical in it, so people think it's critical theory, right? Uh, you, you actually look at who these people are reading and citing. They're not citing Marcuse. They are not citing uh, certainly Adorno and Horkheimer, the key figures of something like the Frankfurt School. Institutionally, where this comes from is the field of critical legal studies within law departments in the United States, which is really postmodernism meets the law, right? It's really where a set of scholars are starting to use the tools of postmodernism and post-structuralism to say, we used to think that when judges make decisions, they just think about doctrine in a kind of objective way, and then they weigh these difficult cases. Like, no, actually what's happening is that they have their biases and they have uh, their material self-interest, and that's sort of what's, what's, what's driving stuff, right? Um, and, and a young set of scholars, many of them non-white, come in and say, well, that's really helpful. Uh, we agree with that critique of the American law, but these critical legal studies people aren't really thinking about race enough. And so people like Derek Bell come in and try and infuse that tradition with considerations of race. Now, now, now Bell is a very interesting figure who um, uh, you know, is uh, an aspiring civil rights lawyer at one point in his life. He does heroic work for the NAACP in the 1960s, desegregating schools and businesses and other institutions throughout the American South. Um, uh, but he comes to think of much of that work as a mistake. He actually takes on the kind of uh, uh, segregationist criticism of civil rights law as lawyers pretending that they're serving their clients, but really just wanting to impose their ideology of integration. Uh, And so he ends up saying, uh, you know, perhaps in some circumstances, the clients that I was working for 
would have been better served by us helping to improve black schools rather than to integrate them. And that becomes a launching point for a much broader critique of uh, integrationist ideals in the civil rights movement. He ends up calling uh, on his followers to reject the defunct racial equality ideology of the civil rights movement, saying that we're only going to make progress if we explicitly treat people differently on the basis of a group of which they are a part. So it becomes the kernel for a lot of the policies today around equity rather than equality, around saying that how the state should treat you in school or in the pandemic should really depend on the racial group of which you are a part. Um, the other element here is a deep skepticism about the ability to make progress. Rather than seeing something like Brown versus Board as progress uh, motivated by activists who fought for it, but also in part by the bad conscience of uh, a majority population that came to see it as an affront against their values, he said, it's all just self-interest and therefore America might cloak uh, how oppressive it is, but it's never going to get less oppressive. The same way that Foucault said, you know, uh, we might think we treat criminals more kindly than we did in the past, we're mentally ill more kindly in the past. In reality, we treat them as badly as we ever did. Bell, until he passed away, said America in the year 2000 is as racist as it was in 1950 or 1850. Okay. Um, so, so just very briefly, you know, there's, there's also the ideas of Kimberly Crenshaw and intersectionality and our inability to understand each other that I could talk about. But you take this set of ideas, and I just think that you get a lot of what our politics today is about. The skepticism about objective truth that you get from Foucault. The sort of politicized version of discourse critique that you get from somebody like Said. The embrace of strategic essentialism um, in, in our political spaces that is inspired by somebody like Spivak. Um, and then the, 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 you know, what you get from critical race theory, the the, the deep skepticism about our ability to make progress, the complete rejection of universalism in favor of these more uh, race-sensitive solutions, um, and finally, uh, the ideas in Crenshaw that we really can't understand each other. So, so, so my argument for why that is a bad intellectual lineage is that I think that helps us understand the present yes. in a way that these other ideas don't. Yeah, and you have a whole section of your book about how these ideas have... Uh, not only infiltrated the narrative, but also our institutions. Given that this is a free speech podcast, you have a long chapter about how these narratives and how these ideas infiltrate kind of our free speech culture. And, and so can you talk a little bit about that? Um, so you broke up for a sec, free speech culture? Yeah. So I, I, you you have those main themes of the identity synthesis, and you talk in the book about how they they affect a number of our institutions and our broader culture, but you also have a long chapter about how they, they affect the free speech discussion and culture more specifically. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and why you see free speech as essential to your, to your, uh, to, to your discussion. Yeah, of course. So, so basically, you know, what we've talked through is the first part of the book so far, and, and, and there's a lot more to it. I hope people read it. There's a second part that tries to explain how these ideas go from being dominant in universities but pretty marginal to society as a whole, to really having a lot of purchase, a lot of influence over our mainstream institutions in, 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 in part two of, of a book. Um, and then in part three, I turn to the applications of those ideas, applications to areas like whether we're able to understand each other if we stand at different intersections of identities and what that means for our model of political solidarity. Um, whether we should be in general skeptical of any forms of mutual cultural influence, decrying them as a form of cultural appropriation, areas like how we should think about the adoption of these forms of what I'm calling progressive separatism in our schools. But one of the chapters that is really important to me and that I'm proud of and is obviously relevant in the context of FIRE is, is about free speech. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the recognition that free speech is about more than the law, that it's about culture of free speech, um, stands at the very inception of this tradition. Right When you go to John Stuart Mill's On, on Liberty, uh, he is clear on the fact that what you need to have all of the virtues of free speech is not just uh, a lack of fear of being locked up for what you say. It's feeling that disagreeing with a prevailing wisdom is not a form of social death. Um, otherwise, people will choose to stay silent. And one of the nice insights he has about, I suppose, 19th century, quote-unquote, cancel culture is 
that it's not just the most visible injustice, which is to that uh, person who speaks out and is punished for it. It's to the many people who choose to remain silent and that the people who lose because of that are often us rather than the person who remains silent because we are not able to gain from their contribution and their wisdom. Um, more broadly, though, I'm, I'm trying to make a case that we sometimes talk about free speech in the wrong ways. We tend to talk, certainly in the philosophical literature, about the great things that come from free speech. And I love those arguments. I agree with them. Um, uh, you know, the idea, not that there's a free market space of ideas and good ideas will always win out, but that free speech allows good ideas to live another day, to have a fighting chance, even if they're not popular in their day. The idea that um, we uh, should have to invent a devil's advocate to argue against us if we all agreed, because it's important to hold our ideas as living truths rather than their dogma. Another idea I agree with. But often when you're making those arguments, and I'm sure, Nico, you, you've had that experience on college campuses and so on, there's a little bit of skepticism saying, well, these things sound nice, but, you know, we live in a scary time. Uh, you know, people are being terribly marginalized and oppressed. And how much should we really care about these nice things we're foregoing, right? And so I think actually the strongest set of arguments for free speech is not about the good things they do for us, but it's about the bad things that happen when we don't have free speech, when we give up on free speech. And I, I think the first one of them, relatively obviously, is that it's a, it's a huge illusion to think that the right people are always going to be in charge. Um, you know, the left has started to debate free speech often on very progressive spaces like campuses. And so they thought, well, when there's a speech code, obviously the administrator is going to be on my side and the kind of speech we're going to censor is, you know, the bad speech, right? But if you actually uh, see that the habit of censoring speech radiate out, and people like Chris Rufo explicitly saying, let me emulate that, right? We should do the same game. We should be in the same game as the leftists. So if they're censoring speeches in their spaces, we're going to use our power, uh, he's close to Ron DeSantis, as the governor of Florida, as the legislators in Florida, to impose our own view, right? Uh, it is really naive to think that in any kind of systematic way, the people who are going to be part of a you know, federal census bureau or you know, speech facilitation committee in Silicon Valley are somehow going to be on the side of uh, uh, the marginalized. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass, one of my load stars, recognized that in his day there was uh, uh, you know, newspapers saying terrible things. Um, uh, uh, but he also recognized that uh, free speech is what allowed uh, people like him, when they were very unpopular, to argue for emancipation. That's why he called it the, the, the dread of tyrants. Um, the, the second argument in that respect briefly, is about elections. Um, you know, one of the core things that makes our democ democracy work is accepting the outcome of elections, unlike certain people. Um, but part of what makes it easier is to know that you have a chance to fight for another day, that if you lose power, you can go into opposition, you can keep making your case, and that allows you to win back favor. If you think that losing power might also mean not being able to be present on certain social media platforms, not being able to... Um, uh, make your case in a full-throated way from the opposition means uh, having your uh, you know social media channels demonetized and so on. The incentive to stay in power at any means possible actually rises. Um, we should be in the game of lowering the stakes of elections rather than continuing to raise them. I, I I like your themes of the identity synthesis because it you know you have seven in your book and you you just went through uh, uh, most of them. They help to explain the erosion of free speech acceptance and within the broader society. For example, skepticism of objective truth. I've never been one that rests the whole free speech argument on the marketplace of ideas thing. The idea that you know truth is always going to win out. Although I do believe, given a long enough time horizon after the passions of moments wear off, that truth generally does win out in the long arc of of history. But if you don't believe in objective truth, you're probably not going to believe in the value of free speech as a uh, discovery tool for truth, right? Um, Identity-sensitive legislation, which is one way the you know, identity synthesis manifests itself. Uh, if you think identity is of paramount importance and equity allows for kind of this sort of identity-sensitive legislation to, to privilege some identities over others, you know, that's going to be a challenge to free speech as at least understood in America as a neutral principle that applies to everyone equally. You know, you see the um, uh, the 
the scales of justice with you know Lady Liberty with her eyes, um, eyes blindfolded, or the idea surrounding um, standpoint theory and 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 kind of my truth and which which while not maybe a direct challenge to free speech is a way to cut off debate and discussion by saying we don't have to have this because I have my own truth so there's nothing that you and I can sort out in conversation together I wanted to ask if you see in any way the the new arguments around speech and violence which maybe aren't necessarily new as kind of fitting in to this broader theme as well, or whether that's something separate from the identity synthesis as, as it manifests itself. Yeah, I think that they're the rooted in, 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 in the same set of ideas. Um, and, you know, Greg Lukianovs and Jonathan Haidt's The Coddling of the American Mind, I think, uh, did a great job explaining how these ideas around safetyism um, help to give them intellectual heft. And I talk about that a little bit in my chapter on free speech as well. Uh, I mean, I do think that part of that is a kind of relatively thinly veiled strategic argument, right? So John Stuart Mill in On Liberty says, well, um, you're not allowed to restrict the liberty of another uh, unless they're harmful to people other than himself, right? Um, and so that becomes the harm principle, the standard that sometimes explicitly and sometimes implicitly is applied in various aspects of our culture and the law. And so if you want to say, but I do want to restrict what these people can say, the obvious move to say is to, is to say, well, and that's because you know, when they say something about the inclusion of trans people in sports that I dislike, then that is a form of harm. Um, there's really no difference between that and the kind of acts of physical violence that we uh, uh, regulate over time, right? So, so I think part of it is, 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 is specious and strategic. That's why these arguments become so, so prominent. Uh, but again, I think that, 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 that they're rooted in many ways in uh, in the postmodernist tradition, when you look at somebody like Stanley Fish, um, you know the idea that there's really no distinction between uh, incitement to violent actions, which is punishable by the law, and uh, offensive speech, which is not punishable by the law, which is uh, uh, covered by the First Amendment. Um, you know, he says, well, there's certain hard cases that lie on the line between those two things, and therefore there's no coherent distinction, and who makes the decision is really just a question of the prevailing discourses that are uh, driven in many ways by the powerful. This is, you know, Foucault meets free speech. <laughs> the, the focus on identity, you talk in the book, um, you, you cite some statistics, for example, that the New York Times use of the phrase racist, for example, had increased by 700% between 2011 and, and 2019. And in the Washington Post, that figure is 1,000%, the use of the word racist in critique. And when I think about it from the free speech perspective, the wielding of these phrases to describe speakers and arguments uh, has really had a profound chilling effect when you talk about you know, the damage of not speakers being punished, but everyone who sees the individual speakers getting punished remaining silent as a result. Nobody wants to be called racist. Nobody wants to be called sexist. Nobody wants to be called homophobic. Nobody wants to be called anything related to these identity concepts. We like to think of us as kind and generous people, but you almost have this expanding circle of things that are considered to be racist, that are considered to be sexist. For example, I use this example. The most absurd one that I've seen is, is Guy Benson, uh, who's a conservative commentator, was set to speak on Brown's campus in 2018, and there was a petition at Brown's campus to have him disinvited or no platformed. Uh, not because they thought he was directly racist, but because he advocated for capitalism, which they th saw as a fascist and white supremacist ideology. So when you talk about the kind of wielding of harm, I, I think that's really kind of at the crux um, of, of why people are remaining silent, because they're wielding these identitarian terms or these terms that might be wrapped up in the identity synthesis as a way to silence people. Do you see it the same way? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, and, and so the question becomes, what do you do about that? How do you respond to that? Sure. Right? Um, and, and I think there's sort of two instincts. One is to say, well, uh, they're going to call us, you know, racist and homophobic, whatever we do, if we dare to criticize these ideas. So let's not be particularly careful. Let's act like jerks. Let's not care. And that's the lesson that a bunch of people on the further right have taken from that. Um, 
but actually, I think when you're trying to uh, persuade reasonable people, uh, whether those kind of charges are true or not is going to matter, right? In the craziest kind of most far-left spaces, these species accusations might stick in really unfair ways. But when it comes to a culture as a whole, people are actually going to make, I think, relatively sophisticated distinctions between this person that's being accused of this terrible thing. Well, is there you know, evidence that they, in fact, are racist or is this just kind of a completely silly slur that's being thrown at them, right? And so one of the things that I want to uh, help do with this book is to provide people with a language that um, pushes back against the identity synthesis in a principled way that is rooted in, in what I see as, as, as some of the most noble political traditions in the United States, right? I, I mentioned Frederick Douglass earlier. I think really one of the most fundamental debates here is between uh, some like Derek Bell and figures like Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King Jr. and I would say Barack Obama, right? Um, they say that, you know, D Douglass... Uh, in his famous speech on the 4th of July, recognizes, of course, that universal values written on a piece of paper are not enough to make our society just. Um, he calls out the hypocrisy of his compatriots who celebrate the Declaration of Independence and the idea that all men are born uh, free and equal when uh, slavery is the law of the land, right? But rather than saying, therefore, we should rip up these documents. He says, by what right are you excluding us from them? If you're serious about these values, if you actually care about these values, right, then how can you justify not allowing us to live in freedom? How, a hundred years later, can you justify us not being able to sit at the front of a bus? How, another 50 years later, can you justify gay people not being allowed to marry in the same way that straight people are allowed to marry, right? So I think um, what's important is to recover the language where we argue for these humanist values on the basis of our recognition that ideas like free speech have made the country more just, that we have made progress, and that the reason why we've made progress is precisely the activism and the hard work, but yes, also the, the aspiration, the, 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 the determination to live up more fully to those kinds of principles. And I think that if you talk about uh, the reasons for why you object to ripping up our founding documents, to claiming that we haven't made any progress on these issues in that language. Some people are still going to call you terrible names and some people might still try to cancel you. But, but I think you're much more likely to, to win over hearts and minds and uh, uh, be an effective defender of a kind of philosophically liberal values that, that you and I both care about. One of, one of the things that you discuss in your book as a reason for supporting a culture of free expression that I think is underappreciated uh, deals with the law of group polarization. Um, and and this, this other concept, though, related that when threats to the in-group are salient, so you have a group of people, the group becomes less open to dissent and criticism, and that becomes a problem. So, you know, I think the law group polarization comes from Cass Sunstein, and he talks about how if you have a group of people where dissent is not present, then that group becomes more polarized in the direction in which, you know, everyone are inclined to believe or where the biases rest. And that, and that groups with a prevailing kind of bias – Ha, are more inclined to exclude the dissenter if what they're dissenting about seems more salient to them. So can you talk a little bit about about this concept of, of, of group polarization and, and, and also how kind of it is affected and has played out uh, with respect to the identity synthesis over the past maybe five, six years? I think we saw a lot of this in the wake of the election of Donald Trump. Uh, in, in, in circles on both the right and the left. I mean, this is one of the sort of areas in which a light bulb really went off in my head as I was doing research for this book and came across this, this really interesting literature in social science about group polarization, but then also more specifically about the role of dissenters within groups, right? And it turns out that most groups are actually reasonably tolerant of dissenters most of the time. If you've been a member of a group for a long time and you say, hey, 
I think what we're doing here right now, I think the norms we're adopting right now are misguided. We're going to be bad for our mission. We're going to lead to the kind of internal meltdowns that we've seen in so many progressive organizations. Perhaps we should slow it a little bit. Perhaps we should really think about uh, how to set things up better. Under normal circumstances, groups are actually likely to, to listen to an in-group member making those kind of criticisms until you get to a condition of threat, until most of the group feels like the threat from an external enemy. And at that point, they don't just stop listening to the in-group dissenter. They often are more angry at the in-group dissenter than at outside critics because suddenly you're a traitor who at this crucial moment we have to stand together is preaching the other side, right? And, and that, I think, is a lot of what happened after, after Donald Trump was elected. When I mean, people, for good reason, for understandable reason, felt threatened, felt that a lot was on the line, that some of the members were in danger in, in real ways. Um, but as a result, they, they, they start to say, if you criticize any of the ideas that are not prevalent in our spaces, if you criticize the way in which the interesting of ultimately wrong-headed ideas of people like Said and Spivak and Bell and Crenshaw were being popularized and frankly vulgarized by people like Robin D'Angelo or Iram X. Kendi, well, then you must secretly be on the other side. And, and, and these two figures, of course, provided the intellectual superstructure for that, saying if you disagree with the terms of this diversity training, that just proves your white fragility and just how racist you are, right? If you disagree with my conclusions um, that a lot of the United States Constitution is racist because it has a racially disparate impact in various ways, then it's not just that you're not anti-racist in the kind of way that I, Ibram X. Kenny, want you to be anti-racist. You are actively racist, right? So, 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 so it's one or the other. Um, there was a great paper by an anthropologist in the 1990s uh, with a wonderful title, How Come That the Enemy of Humanity Always Turns Out to Be the Guy in the Office Down the Hall. And, and part of that is that this is the, the guy you're down the hall you have some power over. The president of the United States you don't have any power over. Right? And so when Trump was elected and people felt that threat, and at first we wanted to get him impeached and this and that, and we realized that was not going to happen, so much of this anger turned at the in-group critics. And that was a really unhealthy dynamic. Yeah, the, I often think about the literature out of the Harvard Business Review and elsewhere that talks about diversity being a strength uh, within corporations or, or other groups. Uh, but the sort of excise of dissenters who have who have different viewpoints seems to strike against and, and create sort of an inconsistency uh, with that with that broader argument. I want to turn now, because we're running out of time, about, and, and you gestured to it earlier uh, in talking about Frederick Douglass and the 4th of July speech, but how did it escape this identity trap, uh, which is compromising various institutions and values like, like freedom of speech. For a reader, is it as simple as it might sound, which is a return to traditional small L liberal values, or is it more complex? Do we need to do anything different than what we've done in the past, or do we just need to rediscover some of the values of what we've done in the past? Um, I think it is mostly holding firm to values that we've had for a long time, but making sure that we realize them in society. Right? So I think liberalism, and rightly understood, has always been a progressive creed. It has always been something that held the reality of your society up against these noble ideals and defends the part of reality that live up to them, but also is deeply conscious of the ways in which reality inevitably fails to live uh, up to part of them. Right? So, so uh, my prescription is not one for quietism, um, uh, but it is... Uh, important to recognize that we have made progress. Because if you believed, like people like Bell do, but we've made no progress at all, then, you, then it's reasonable to say, well, let's rip, rip the whole thing up, right? Like, why should we care about free speech if we've made no progress? Why should we care about the Constitution if we've made no progress, right? So you have to have a subtle view of this. We've made tremendous progress. I mean, anybody who thinks we haven't made progress on gay rights, remember that within your and my lifetime, and we're both reasonably young, um, uh, uh, Ellen DeGeneres was... You had to give up her talk show once you publicly acknowledge having a girlfriend, right? How can you say we haven't made progress on, on, on gay rights? I think that's just a, a crazy thing to believe, right? So, so here's the way that I think about it. You can boil down the tradition we've been talking about to three main claims. Not every member of this tradition believes in every claim in exactly that way, but this is, I think, really the, the driving force of this ideology. Number one, 
the key prism for understanding society, the key prism for understanding our social interaction or big historical events is identity categories like race and gender and sexual orientation. Number two, documents like the Constitution, values like free speech, were really just designed to pull the wool over, the, over your eyes. The purpose of them is to perpetuate those forms of discrimination. And that's why we haven't been able, supposedly, to make any progress. And so finally, to make progress, you have to rip up those institutions. You have to rip up the value of free speech. You have to give up on universalism and explicitly make uh, how we think of ourselves, how we treat each other, how the state treats all of us, depend on the groups in which we're born. I think there's very good liberal responses to this, which take seriously the persistence of racism and other problems, which take seriously the role that identity does play in the world, but without throwing the baby out of the bathwater. And that's a point-by-point -point rebuttal. It's number one. Yes, of course, race and gender and sexual orientation matter. But as Jonathan Haidt has said very nicely, uh, uh, in an essay for persuasion, actually, a monomaniacal view of reality is really dangerous. These things matter, but so does social class. So does religion. So does your individual attributes. So does your actual actions. So does your tastes and predilections, right? Instead of coming to a situation with your mind made up what's going to explain it, you have to look at the situation and that that determined how you think about reality. Robin D'Angelo says that every time that a white person interrupts a black person, they're bringing the entire apparatus of white supremacy to bear on them. That might be true in certain circumstances, uh, but it's not true in many others, when perhaps you're good, good friends who love debating about politics and interrupt each other the way we've been interrupting each other in this yeah, conversation. Sure. Right? <laughs> um, we actually talked about interrupting each other because it makes the conversation more dynamic and more reflective of what the conversation we would have if we were having coffee. Uh, in a right, sense. right. Secondly, um, uh, the, uh, it's simply not true that we haven't been able to, to make progress. It's incomplete. We have to fight for more progress, but we have been able to make progress. We've been able to make progress because of values like free speech. And so thirdly, rather than ripping those things up, we have to, we have to live up to them. So that's the sort of philosophical response. I think there's also a practical response about how to argue about those things, how to talk about those things, who to be in conversation with, but that's a slightly different question. Yeah. Well, I hope that our listeners got a taste of what your excellent book, The Identity Trap, is about from this conversation, and I urge them to pick it up. Um, by the time this discussion is published, the book should be available. Um, it comes out on September 26th. Um, but I, I, I think if critics of what you term the identity synthesis um, are going to be effective in advocating for free speech, they need to understand the intellectual history that has led to a lot of these criticisms of free speech. And I think, you know, in part one of your book, especially, you do a great job of that and then rebutting some of those arguments. And if free speech advocates are going to be effective, they need to know the arguments and some of the rebuttals. And you put that all here in one nice, neat package. So I appreciate it, Yasha. I hope to have you on again. And thanks for coming well, on the show. To. Thank you, Nico. <laughs> and, and I'd urge our listeners, too, to check out Yasha and pers and his publication persuasion as we mentioned at the top of the show fire has periodically written for persuasion we find it to be an excellent community for people who are interested in discussing a diversity of ideas not always agreeing about them but kind of coming together uh, for thoughtful discussion about them and again yasha and, and, that and is since, since and since you're so kindly praising us uh you know the listeners to this podcast don't need to be told this but i'm so happy that that, that fire exists especially at a time when other organizations are not uh, standing up for free speech in the ways we need to, not being consistent in their principles. Uh, you guys have really just stepped into a breach in a way that uh, uh, that is very consequential and very important. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And I hope if we ever strayed from those values, you would call us out in the same way you call out some other institutions and individuals in your book, The Identity Trap. So Yasha, again, thank you for coming on the show. And everyone, please check out The Identity Trap, a story of ideas and power in our time. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, and it is edited by my colleagues Ella Ross and Aaron Reese. If you have feedback on the show, as always, you can email us at so to speak at the fire.org. And until next time, I thank you all again for listening. <laughs>